Professor Haverell, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored indescribably by having my name attached to this important meeting. It goes without saying that the primary purpose of the conference is to celebrate the silver anniversary of the first liver transplantation in Turkey. It was, in fact, the first such operation in the Middle East and portions of adjacent Eastern Europe, Asia, and Africa. Because of the importance of this milestone, it is appropriate to ask who made it possible and how. The person was a truly exceptional young man who joined my transplant program at the University of Colorado almost 40 years ago with the specific intention of bringing back to his beloved country a new technology that did not exist there. Dr. Haverell had a list of steps that had to be taken before reaching his ultimate objective of liver replacement. The first was effective treatment of end-stage kidney disease with dialysis and kidney transplantation. Within little more than a year after returning home, Mehmet had founded the beginning of a network of dialysis centers and kidney transplant that eventually led to his historical liver operation on December 8, 1988. The presence in Turkey of the young superstar did not go unnoticed. Mehmet's presence at medical meetings brought distinction and international respect for his country. For the record, he is the only Turkish citizen ever to be elected as an honorary foreign member of the prestigious American Surgical Association and the even more elite Institute of Medicine of the United States National Academy of Science. Professor Haberl's instincts always were those of an educator. Between 1982 and the summer of 2007, I made five visits to Turkey. During that quarter century, I saw the birth and growth of one of the country's finest universities in which medicine was only one of the disciplines. It was an accomplishment that I look back at even now as nearly miraculous. Along the way, Mehmet founded the Turkish Transplantation Society, the Middle East Society of Transplantation, MISAT, and the new journal, Experimental and Clinical Transplantation, the official organ of MISAT. It was during this rich and productive period of his life that Mehmet started his liver transplant program on December 8, 1988. It is interesting to reflect on the status of liver transplantation at that time. There had been only about 2,000 liver transplants done in the world. Objectives that had been accomplished included better control of blood coagulation, better means of liver preservation, a more thorough understanding of infections, and guidelines for the use of venovenous bypasses. The most important advances up to 1988, however, had been with immunosuppression. While it was true that liver transplantation with survival for at least one year was first accomplished in July 1967, the one-year survival was too poor to allow liver replacement to be viewed as a service. Thus, liver transplantation had reached the status of feasible but impractical. Although the one-year survival never rose above the 50% level during this time, the continued existence of liver recipients who had reached this one-year milestone and remained alive was a constant reminder of the operation's potential value. Four of these pioneer patients, all treated in Colorado while Mehmet Haberil was working there, have now borne their hepatic allografts for 40 to 44 years. These are the longest surviving liver recipients in the world. As of 1980, Four new liver transplant centers had been added to our original one in Denver. All of the new ones were in Europe. The center founded at Cambridge University in England by Roy Kahn, followed in succession by the Paris program of Henri Bismuth, the Hanover Center uh, in Germany of Rudolf Pickelmeyer, and the Dutch Center of Rudi Kram. 
Most of the policies of liver transplantation that exist today were developed by the Transatlantic Alliance of the Five Centers. The seemingly grim future of liver transplant dramatically changed with the arrival of cyclosporin. When we combined cyclosporin with prednisone, our one-year survival rose to 80%. Liver transplantation had now become a clinical service rather than an experimental procedure. In a 17-page article that I published in the New England Journal of Medicine in October 1989, the text began with the following statement. The, con the conceptual appeal of liver transplantation is so great that the procedure may come to mind as a last resort for virtually every patient with lethal hepatic disease. It was already evident that there would be a large disparity between the availability of and demand for livers. Discussions and disputes now centered around the most efficient and fair way to allocate the organs. Meanwhile, we had set in motion preclinical studies of tacrolimus in Pittsburgh that led to its substitution for cyclosporin and fast-track FDA approval. With tacrolimus, there were further improvements in survival with liver and ultimately all kinds of organ transplantation. And in addition, procedures that included the intestine or consisted of the intestine alone were elevated by tacrolimus to the status of clinical service. The world's longest surviving multivisceral recipient, now a school teacher, is 24 years post-transplantation. There is little point in going into more detail about the problems and progress of organ transplantation overall, or those of the liver specifically. These issues make up much of the fine program that will begin as soon as I am finished. Suffice it to say, an early start was given to Turkey and to the Middle East generally by Mehmet Haberil's historical case. Thank you very much.